The poetry of James Kirkham is hardly remembered. He died a couple of years ago and his work was essentially in print in the Listener but the poetry magazines in the 40s, the 50s and the 60s long before the time of the internet and by the time the internet came Kirkup was living permanently in exile in Andorra where he died I think in 2011 and um, his work is sadly almost totally forgotten it's very difficult to find his work anywhere although there are four collected volumes published by Salzburg University Press um, Kirkup himself did not like his contemporaries and his contemporaries certainly did not for the most part like him uh, I never met him but I did meet someone who had met him when I was in my final year as a student of English at Leeds Training College in 1964 um, the college's external examiner was Professor Valentine Cunningham of, 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 of Leicester University. And I remember in my Viva, um, Cunningham had already read some of my poems, which I submitted as part of my uh, final thesis. And uh, he had actually met Kirkup, and he said he is a very strange man. But I can see how you would be influenced and inspired by him. And I never met anyone then who had actually known Kirkup even briefly and um, looking on the cover of the first of Kirkup's volume of collected poems Kirkup dismissed the work of his English contemporaries now we would say UK contemporaries I am tired of the petty domestic provincial academic verse of the majority of my contemporaries and have always turned to foreign poets for companionship in the lonely art of poetry. British poetry publishing is dead because its poets are only half alive. I think he's talking here about the insularity of British poets. When Eliot was writing and bound, Eliot was immensely um, influenced by French poetry, by La Forgue in particular, and um, sadly this interest in French poetry seems almost completely extinct. Reading contemporary English poetry, I do agree with Kirkup, and this was written by Kirkup many years ago, which is immensely insular. There is no sense of Paul Valéry, there's no sense of Baudelaire, of Rimbaud, there is no sense of anything except a kind of immediacy of political correctness which is extremely narrow and will of course with time wither as other political issues come to the fore. Kirkup was particularly good in writing about the places he lived in. In his autobiographies, the first two volumes, his upbringing in South Shields, in his travel books about periods spent lecturing in Japan, the University of Singapore in Malaysia, and even about the grave of Emily Dickinson during a brief tenured creative professorship, I believe, in the USA. Um, his sense of place was remarkable. A place I know very well and Kirkup knew equally well is Leeds and its unbelievably real and historically marvellous Kirkup market which is the largest covered market in Europe. Sadly, in recent years, a lot of the magic has gone. A lot of the traders have gone. Um, it is very disappointing, but when Kirkup wrote about it in 1951, 
it was the market I knew. 1950 when I was 10 years old. And this poem, Wreath Makers, Leeds Market, is a poem that was put into many anthologies in the 1950s and 60s but sadly now seems to have disappeared from view. Wreath Makers, Leeds Market. A cocksure boy in the gloom of the gilded market bends with blunt fingers a bow of death and the flowers work with him. They fashion a grave of grass with dead bracken and fine ferns. An old woman with a mouthful of wires and a clutch of irises mourns in perpetual black and her fists with the sunken rings rummage in the fragrant work basket of a wreath. A laughing flora dangles a cross between her thighs like a heavy child, feeds it with pale plump lilies, crimson roses, wraps it in greenery and whips it with wires. And here a grieving flower god with a lyre in his arms fumbles mute strings in the rough, gentle machine of his fingers, his eyes wet violets, and in his mouth a last carnation. Mourners all, they know not why they mourn, but work and breathe the perfumes of their trade, those flower voices through which death more keenly speaks. With suitable dispassion, though they know their emblems fade, and they at last must bear a yellowed wreath that other hands and other harvesters have made. Uh, Kirkup had also other talents, but before I pass on to them I would like to read a poem about London. Kirkup briefly worked as a teacher there I think this is one of his finest poems of atmosphere. It's called In a London Schoolroom. Arms in cool dresses shine. Boys' throats are bare. The murmuring blackboards quiver in a haze of chalk. Summer has come, but will not enter these open windows that the sunlight blinds with heat and shutters with despair. The trees of hands and faces tosses in the gales of talk. A flashing desk lid like a bomb explodes, spelling disaster, a final tree of dust. These are the children bred by war, whose lives fret at their ignorance of peace. There is no answer to the questions they have raised, no hand to ask. No cloudless holiday that would release life that is sick Hope that was never there. No task make plain the words they cannot learn to trust. Not we, who fail to understand, but only time can teach a lesson they will not forget and educate with pain these last pretenders of an innocence they know is vain. Kirkup's experience of teaching was very different to mine. He was obviously teaching presumably in the east end of London, very poor children, and um, this is clearly reflected here. Um, there is a side of Kirkup which particularly has always appealed to me, which is not this kind of uh, spirit of place poem. Uh, these, there are other poems which are very lyrical and are not really situated in time and space. This is one of his most successful. It's called Negro Spirituals. Oh, the dark hole of a thrummed guitar. Electric strings parallel with thrilling fingers. Haunted mouth drugged with the sorrow of a hidden song. The dim windows coin your head with cold but you dream soft chords of dark gold, sweet words chanted for a bitter time, lost in the double dusk of faith and longing, 
eyes dark white with bored oblivion, or bruise the lips profoundly rose, half opened, brilliant seeded fruit. Calm, O oh, languorous and mute desire, for coloured mythical calypso shade, wherein cruel heat, love's tender miracles, leap naked sand, or cool fountains mingle deep dances in a jungle trance. Dark is the city to your moon-tipped fingerings, but white stars of your upturned hands in rhythmed prayer shine on in the foreign solitude. Warm in the gloom, your grieving flower lives again and breathes its song. Apart from foreign poets, mainly French poets like Valéry, who Auden translated, who Kirkup translated, there seem very few English poets that Kirkup admired. The only one that I can recollect is Auden, and Auden, of course, had more or less permanently emigrated and become a U.S. citizen. And this poem I share shared Kirkup's admiration for Auden. This is a poem he wrote. Letter to a Poet Whiston Hugh Auden, with your back set against your own and only wall, but facing the gradual breakup of the old home that is our disappearing world, facing the boredom of these intolerable hours from now until the end of term, you who made the Midlands evil geography your own and are charting for the universal, I do not know why I should write to you. This letter, that as much as anything else is pure pretense, of vanity as idle as our lost serenity and measured years of peace. Here, in the English hills, the heart has gone out of the summer and the rose drops its ordered petals without meaning into a long and useless afternoon. The sky is blue or grey, but always empty of the real sun that has sunk forever under the horizon of our bones no longer blessed. Men and women walk no more with warmth or coldness in their limbs and faces, and words are without sound or weight. Only the animals remain unchanged, that they have always known. Neither you, Whiston, nor any other now could save us. The summer holidays will end in breaking weather, and then return return will be another term of growing tension followed by the worst matron has got the lockers emptied the air tech shirts and sun hats put away the trunks are packed and labelled and some who in large cars will be leaving here forever now take an unemotional farewell of form room and field the humorous photographer has come and gone the group is fixed the speeches prizes and singing the hobbies exhibition and the terrible reports are done. I shall join the queue to London with the rest, and take the train to Venice or Madrid if they will let me, and see my friends again, if they are there, how they are dressed and speak, and there is no more magic in the view. To you who said what I cannot forget, and told us calmly what would be our fate, who suffered war and famine in the rich and easy years, when we were blindly idle and too consciously amused, who saw how little we had left to live for if we did not live for love. I send this greeting, trusting it will get to you in time. If I am well, he is hoping that this finds you, yourself, the same. 